coming over to the session on rubenomics and how do you how do you reimagine the the rural urban economies and delighted to have a very distinguished uh, a, a spectrum of uh, panelists ranging right from research analysis and looking at the indian economy to people who work with social entrepreneurs to microfinancing and crowdfunding uh, uh, rural entrepreneurs as well as uh, people from Mahesh from NSDC, Mark and, uh, and Ankur who see it from an investor lens and looking at, at portfolio companies. So wonderful to have all of you. Uh, the structure of this panel is that, you know, I'll start off with a, with a brief presentation about what, are, what is it that we define as Rubenomics? How are we seeing it played on the ground? Uh, early days yet. Uh, and then we will then have a round of comments, perspectives by each of the panelists for about five to six minutes. And then we'll open up the floor for, uh, for discussions. As Herald I uh, has worked in largely in rural Karnataka, or I will define it as Rubin Karnataka, and before I jump in to the, the defining what Rubenomics is, let me define our, our perspective of what a Rubin is. And let me just illustrate this as an example. There's a district in Karnataka called Gadag. We did a quick poll among some 70 Bangaloreans and said, do you know where Gadag is? And about almost 45 of them said, we have never heard of the place. Right? It's about 400 kilometers from Bangalore. Uh, Gadag, Gadag district is about 11 lakh people. But Gadag town is about one and a half lakh people. Uh, and if you transplant Gadag town into any other suburb of Bangalore, it will be quite indistinguishable from any of the other suburbs. But 10 kilometers beyond Gadak town, you start entering the taluks and the villages. And we define Gadak town to be the fringes of the urban and rural. Right? And we're saying if we can use that, that, that town as an anchor to deliver a variety of services, goods, to bring in entrepreneurs, talent, etc., and use that as a rural plus urban minus uh, fringe, then there is a huge amount of uh, growth that we believe can be driven uh, by anchoring a variety of activities at that, uh, at that Ruben location. Right? Uh, so in that context, I want to share briefly four trends that we're seeing uh, from the work that we're doing on the ground. And we did actually a survey around uh, some of the trainees that we have in, uh, in, in our, we have about 16 training centers across Karnataka, and I want to share some of those insights as well. On the talent front, we have about this is a snapshot of the 300 odd trainees that we currently have in our training system. Interesting trends come out. One, about 25% of them are zero educated and school dropouts. None of them speak a word of English. Uh, and, and all of them have never touched a computer. We've trained about 1,000 people so far. 90% of them are placed in a variety of sectors in about six months' time. Ours is an intensive immersive learning program, and we are able to see talent transform quite dramatically. Uh, and we've seen them work in places and in, in, in sectors like healthcare, retail, hospitality, financial services. We run our own rural BPO, where it's interesting and ironical that when a graduate in Gurgaon, it's one of the largest BPOs in, in the country, the termination letter is sent by a zero educated villager uh, from Tumku. So we've been able to see that the potential uh, of transformation uh, is vast and there is unlimited potential. Right? And interestingly, all the 300 people that we have in training so far, in, at this point of time, all of them have paid for the training program. So there's no grant, there's no scholarship. They really recognize that it is possible to transform themselves and drive their own aspirations. Right? So uh, you know, this is one of our poster boys of sorts, of Venkat, who is zero educated, used to work as a house cleaner, in 2009, now works as a team leader in the BPO, earning about uh, 10,000 rupees a month in Tumkur. We are also recognizing that they come with huge aspirations. Uh, again, just last week, I did an aspiration survey of all of our trainees and asked them, what do you want to be? Why are you at this program? And the top three aspirations, interestingly, 31% of them said, I want to be a businessman. And these are the, I've just taken a snapshot of the zero educated school dropouts. 16% of them said they want to be teachers and 20% professionals, so a doctor, engineer, lawyer. Interestingly, 70% of them said they want a job in their own districts or hometowns. Right? About 20% of them said I want to move to a metro, 
uh, and 10% were location agnostic. Almost all of the parents of these trainees are zero educated. And uh, no one else in the family have taken up any of the roles that they are aspiring to be. And, and the listed role models like Dr. Kalam, Saram Vishweshwaraya, Swami Vivekananda, and interestingly, a lot of them said, my inspiration and role model is someone else in my village who has gone through a training program, transformed, I want to be like him. Right? What I will do is I will tie in some of these uh, 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 data and insights that we have into questions that we will define for the panel as we go along and, and have their takes on it. Uh, Chandana, again, uh, was an SSL dropout, used to work in Chiknai, used to live in Chiknai, like Kalini in Tumkur, and she is now managing one of our centers at Tumkur. And so the aspirational, and she says that she wants to set up a women-only owned business in Tumkur, and she's eternally badgering all of us saying, I have this idea, can we do something about it? I'm sure, you know, she will go on to become a super successful entrepreneur, uh, and so on and so forth. One of the things that we're realizing is that talent, for talent's sake and employability for employability's sake, without integrating it tightly to market linkages, we're seeing a lot of leakages of people who have aspirations but not finding jobs or careers that meet their aspirations. And in that realization, we said, let's launch an entrepreneurial uh, pathway as a career path. And let's build an entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we launched something called as Antarprerna, which is a play on the word entrepreneur, uh, but also means inner motivation. And we launched it in four districts and said, you know what, let's create it as an ecosystem. Let's get people in, let's do monthly meetings, let's do you know, mentoring, inspirational talks, so on and so forth, and help really uh, craft their own business ideas. We had about 560 entrepreneurs turning up for our launch events across these four districts. Interestingly, 68% of them said, I'm interested to engage with you for a year. We've had two monthly meetings where most of them have turned up. Right? So, and all of them said, this is the first time that we are coming together to discover about growing our business and not about just a trade skill that we've been given or a loan certificate being given. Uh, we did an interesting workshop with about uh, uh, 18 entrepreneurs, uh, and we defined entrepreneurs as somebody who hires two plus people. Uh, we believe that job creation is a very critical aspect of being an entrepreneur. And only 18, and just I'm taking a sample of Gadag, only 18 of uh, the 85 members we have in Gadag hire two people and more. The rest are all solopreneurs or, or self employed uh, entrepreneurs. A lot of them said, Why are you into this? Because we don't have any other choice. Right? So, uh, we're trying to figure out then how do you then create more choices for an entrepreneur career. So this is the third element. Uh, you know, just as an example, Sandeep came out of our training program, had a job in a BPO, said, I'm not going to take it up, set up a, a rural distribution center in Gokak. And a couple of months ago, he emailed us saying that, hey, I've crossed about uh, two lakh uh, rupees in revenue uh, by selling this to his community around. Uh, this was a workshop that we did by two professors of entrepreneurship from INSEAD who asked entrepreneurs in Gadag, how will you grow your business? And it was fascinating because at the end of six hours, half of what the entrepreneurs said, these guys couldn't understand. And half of what these guys said, the entrepreneurs couldn't understand. But everybody said, this is the first time anybody is asking us questions like this. I don't know the answers, but I'm inspired to find the answers. Right? And lastly, we all know that in a country which has more mobile phones than people or mobile connections and people. Access to technology is really deep. We recently did a couple of surveys which kind of shocked me as well in terms of the extent at which technology adoption is happening. We did a survey on what kind of phones do people use, again in Gadag and four districts. We surveyed on smartphone usage. And 53% of the people that we talked to, and this is not in the Rubin town, but in the, in the taluks as well, have used a smartphone. And 73% of them said they accessed internet on mobile. Right? The, the last data that I saw for access on internet or mobile was 34% or 35%, uh, which was a year and a half ago. Now, this could be because it is Gadag in Karnataka. Now, if you take an average across the low-income states or whatever, that will come down. But this is an indication of the trend that we are seeing. We also did an e-commerce survey saying, how many of you heard about online shopping? Right? How many of you know about it? And this we did it on about 100 respondents in uh, Gadag town and a couple of districts. 90% of them said, I know that there is something that you can buy online, right? And by recall, they were trying to recall a few names, so they knew about Flipkart, somebody knew about Snapdeal, so on and so forth. And 47% of them, which is quite high, said that I've actually transacted online, right? I've had a cousin who's in Hubli, I've got products delivered to him, and they deliver it to my village, so on and so forth. So the pace of access of technology is 
in, 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 in our opinion, is, is going on much faster uh, than what we think it is. Uh, this is a survey that we had actually done with Ashoka and Vishnu Web, you know, where we actually took tablets, took a mobile uh, solar charger, um, and we did uh, surveys on malnutrition, and we were able to prove that with connections and signals, even in, even in the taluks, we were able to get these uh, surveys synced up um, uh, seamlessly. So what it does to us is that's how this concept of Rubenomics came in about a year ago, saying if you put these four elements of access to technology, entrepreneurial spirit, aspirations, and talent, there could be a new rule that could be constructed away from whatever that we've been doing so far or on top of whatever we've been doing so far. Uh, and is there a model that can be constructed? Is there a framework that we can change uh, in our own thinking is what this panel uh, uh, you know, when we were discussing with, the, with, with Sankalp and the team, saying that this could make an interesting perspective to get to here. Uh, uh, what are the challenges? What are the possibilities of positive outcomes? And what are the things that we need to watch out for when we push on for these outcomes? So the discussions uh, points, I'll just put it, uh, uh, put it up here and then move on to the panel is how do we create really careers in rural rather than just livelihoods? How can we move beyond livelihoods? Of course, livelihoods are important, but how do we think beyond livelihoods into sustainable careers? How can we integrate careers with market opportunities rather than just training for employability alone and, and hoping that the market forces will take care of it? Because to, to my mind, that connection is not as strong as it is supposed to be. Uh, how can we focus on job creators rather than just solopreneurs? Uh, most of the uh, entrepreneur so-called interventions are largely at self-employed and largely at a training level. How do we create an ecosystem uh, that can help uh, build an entrepreneurial mindset? We heard this in the, in the morning as well, that it is a mindset issue. Now, how do we change that mindset? What does rural growth look like in five years? What aspirational changes are we seeing? Right? And what aspirations of youth do we need to cater to? Is there, is there some changes of that aspirations itself that we need to think about? And lastly, how can we leverage uh, technology uh, uh, to increase access into of, of how do you match capabilities and opportunities by leveraging technology? And is there a new model of technology that we need to think of for addressing uh, the needs of rural? These are some, some placeholders, some pointers for the discussion. I'm sure this will go on in multiple directions. You know, I haven't touched upon Agri here, and that's how we have Mark on the, on the panel, uh, you know, to bring, to bring his perspectives on Agri, uh, and so on and so forth. So with that, I just want to invite uh, each of the panelists to weigh in with their thoughts, perspectives. Uh, I'll start off with Neelkant. Neelkant uh, at Credit Suisse uh, has published a variety of reports on the emergence uh, and the growth that rural India is seeing, and has put out some fascinating reports on uh, insights of what, what's happening in rural India. So perhaps I can ask uh, Neelkant to share his perspectives, and then we can go around the so, uh, thank you, Madan. Uh, I think it's a privilege to be here and uh, talking to you all. Uh, I'll just start off with uh, how we uh, got into analyzing this part of the economy. And uh, when we were looking at the macroeconomic parameters of India, uh, you know, what is GDP, how is GDP growth calculated, uh, what kind of employment exists, uh, you know, uh, very basic things like why is it that for the last two years a taxi driver in Bombay earns more than an engineer entering Infosys. And this has been a complete transformation of India over the last five years and we just don't understand why this is happening. Uh, what, what I think the macro economists in India, I think the policy makers and to a large extent the media and the corporates uh, I think fail to understand is that 90% of India's workforce works in the informal economy. As per various surveys done uh, in 2005, there were uh, I mean, 4.2 crore uh, uh, enterprises in India, 42 million enterprises in India, with an average employee strength of 2.4. When I mention this to people, people say, oh, are you missing a few zeros here and there? When we are not. So these are all uh, as Madan was saying, entrepreneurs who work for themselves. These are small mom and pop stores. That's the nature of India's economy. And there is a complete dearth of data on uh, how is output changing, uh, uh, how are wages changing, uh, how are incomes changing. And 
so, so we started to uh, take uh, a step back and say, let's stop relying on official data. Let's stop looking at GDP numbers and, and whatever is reported in the media, and let's start doing work for ourselves. The moment we did that, we realized that just the access to rural roads, you know, so there's been in the last 10, 12 years, there's been 400,000 kilometers of rural roads built. The, the rural mobile telephony, the penetration has gone from 2% to over 50% now. What this does is that the 90% of the workforce which works in the informal economy, their productivity, their employability goes up many fold. If you just imagine uh, a, a worker, an unskilled worker in a village which doesn't have road access and he also doesn't have a cell phone, he will only be able to work for four months in a year because he doesn't even know what exists outside and the effort taken to know what exists outside is just too large. The moment you connect his village with an all-weather road, the moment you hand him a cell phone, he suddenly starts working eight months a year, six months a year. And then a very virtuous cycle takes off. And this is not Narega, this is not minimum support prices. I think the, the, the business media and most of my analyst community, I think are getting it completely wrong. It is very simply that Adam Smith's policies, the, the, the theories of economics are now starting to apply in India. And this is happening for the first time since independence. So this is something that is absolutely unprecedented in the history of India, that uh, we are now integrating a very, very large part of the economy and bringing them into the mainstream. So there are very, there is a very strong job creation happening in India. While we keep fretting about the lack of jobs for the educated, the reality is there are 13 million new houses being built every year in India. You can imagine the number of bricks that needs, so you can imagine the increase in the number of brick kilns. You can imagine the increase in the carpentry work that is needed. You can imagine the work in electricity, I mean the, the electrification work that is needed. You can think about as the workers go from earning for four months in a year to six months or eight months in a year, how their dietary patterns change. They start consuming more chicken, they start consuming more fruits and vegetables. When they start doing that, uh, you start seeing more job creation happening just supplying chicken to them, just supplying fruits and vegetables to them. And there is a very virtuous spiral that is going on, uh, fruits and vegetables are very labor intensive. They, they, you need three to four times as much labor in growing uh, in one acre of, uh, of fruits and vegetables as you would say in cereals because it's much easier to automate. Think about tomatoes, you know, just transplanting saplings to plucking tomatoes. You all need, I mean, you cannot do away the human interface. And the, as more and more employment gets created, there's more income coming up and the, the food habits, the consumption habits, they're all changing all over India. The unfortunate part is, it is not reflected in any official statistics. And therefore, I think the policy makers, I mean, other than some visionary leaders who started with that Pradhan Mantri Gram Salak Yojana, the Prime Minister's Rural Road Scheme or the Electrification Scheme, other than those visionary leaders, I think even the policy makers are blind to this. I, I presented to many senior people in the government I presented to the boards of large corporates in India. And I think most people, while they see there is strong demand coming in from the rural areas, they are unable to fathom why it's happening and how sustainable this is. The, the framework, very simply, is that you are now creating economic structures which are much larger than they used to be. So if you have a village of 2,000 people, there are only a certain types of jobs that you can do and no one can specialize. So if you are a, a wall painter in a village of 2,000 people, if you are a chicken farmer in a village of 2,000 people, I mean, you will not have work to do and therefore you won't exist. The moment you create a cluster of 100 villages, connecting them with roads and, and cell phones, you automatically start seeing uh, more jobs for people and more conveniently priced chicken and better painted walls for people. I mean, it is very basic economics. The sad thing is our policymakers for 60 years are sleeping on it. It is only now that the corp corporate India is now realizing that this is for good. This is actually going to sustain. And so your question about how sustainable this is, I think this can last another 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, there is a lot of catch up that needs to be done. And for good reason, governance is now reaching the grassroots. 
So state governments, uh, and this is a change in Indian politics, that state governments are becoming much more powerful and much more responsive. They're getting re-elected if they deliver the basic functions. I mean, when I present to foreign investors, the questions I get asked are, this is so basic, what took you 60 years to figure it out? Well, whatever happened, now the politicians have figured it out. And so now, the delivery of basic services, I mean, think about uh, uh, firewood. 49% of Indian households cook with firewood. If you've ever tried doing that, and I'm sure many people here would have seen people doing that, I mean, it is hugely time consuming. It takes two hours to collect firewood, you put a layer of mud on the stove, you put a layer of mud on the utensils, you scrub it clean every week. It's massively time consuming. Given induction cooktop and electricity connection, you save the lady of the house three hours a day. And these basic things are now starting to happen. And therefore, I think that um, uh, this, this growth is here to stay. Um, I think corporate India, as it reaches out into these areas, you will create more jobs. I think the setup of rural stores, so if you go out to the villages now, every single village will have three to four stores. And they're not like brightly lit air-conditioned stores, but they're hole-in-the-wall kind of stores. But they're creating a million jobs a year. You will see more and more of these activities coming through. I think uh, corporate India will also design products like, you know, Horlicks. There used to be a 100 rupee pack. Uh, it wasn't useful enough for a people in, in the village. Now there's a 25 rupee pack. It's a win-win for everyone. So, so Glaxo sells more Horlicks. People actually get to consume Horlicks. And I think you will see more and more of this innovation. There'll be more job creation. Uh, and I think this, is, this growth is here to stay. And I'm sure as my fellow panelists speak, you will see many, many more facets of this. This is a speak on, topic on which I can speak for three hours. I think in five, seven minutes, that's, that's the best I could Thanks, Neil. So it's fundamental economics, virtuous cycle kicking in, corporates looking at it seriously, policymakers waking up to it, uh, and, and you're saying politics it's... Changing. Politics changing, governance. Politics changing, governance changing, and you're saying it looks sustainable. Now, let me get to Mark and get to one of the first things that comes up whenever anybody says rural is agriculture, right? So, Mark, yeah. your perspectives, you know, 15% uh, of GDP. Very happy to, to follow on this point. Um, I am similarly uh, optimistic, bullish, uh, on the future of rural India. Um, many of the same trends, right, that, that my fellow panelist just mentioned are in play in, in the agricultural economy today. So let's, let's set the context here, right? So agriculture, give or take, and, and he argues to add to it, is about 15% of the nation's GDP. You could say ballpark 50% of the rural GDP of the nation. In that space, right, if we're talking about the transformation of, of rural India, if we're talking about connectivity and mobility, right, if we're talking about better roads, there is no way to actually create enough jobs to allow for that transformation without the fundamental transformation of agriculture itself, right? This is the place where 40% of our labor is buried, where, they, where, where it is, and let's be very clear, underutilized. This is a mass of semi-employment and underemployment. And if we're going to look at the integration of the rural economy with the urban economy, the only way to do it is to essentially light agriculture on fire and push it to an entirely different level than it's ever been. The, the framework that, that we think about informally in, in Omnivore um, and that essentially is what we take into account when we invest. It, it, I'll, I'll call it, you know, I, I put a shorthand around it, which is YAPE, Y-A-P-E, which is yield, automation, processing, and exports. And let's take each of these pieces. The only way we're ever going to make the rural economy deliver the value that it needs to deliver as a proportion of the population that it absorbs is to see the agricultural yields in India reach, forget about global levels, right? Everyone understands that in many cases we're half or one third of global levels. If we can just get the Indian peak yield, right? The Indian peak yield of wheat, the Indian peak yield of rice on a national basis, 
we're talking about more than a doubling of agricultural productivity, right? So it's not an insurmountable goal. And all of a sudden, when you do that, the underemployment becomes less of an issue, right? Because essentially, the agricultural sector in India chronically underproduces relative to its potential. This is a legacy of, you know, and, and, it, and it's a policy legacy that is still haunting us. We still have the memory of the 1960s embedded in the way we think about policy with a ship-to-mouth existence. We still, you know, and at the same time, we, we talk about modernization and industrialization as if the China path is the only way to do it. India has the potential to double or triple its yields, but we never talk about the potential to become another Brazil. The truth is, we could. It requires a very different set of priorities. It requires a very different set of infrastructure than what we've built. It requires a different mindset, an export mindset, a processing mindset, and that's the point of all of this, but it all begins with yield. It all begins with reaching the peak productivity that we can reach. And then when we do that, when we do that, the other side of it is automation, which is to say that we don't need 40% of the nation to be on farm, right? Agriculture is not a 365 day a year job. It just isn't. And anyone who thinks it is, is crazy, right? It is a job of fits and spurts, panic, right? Working nonstop for three weeks, then chilling out for six weeks, then working nonstop for, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it comes in waves. You don't need as many people doing it as, as we have. And the answer to this, right, is mechanization, it's automation. And this is a lot of what we invest in in Omnivore. If you look at our portfolio companies, right, if you look at Kedut, if you look at, at Stellaps, a lot of these, uh, Mitra, a lot of these are companies that are developing innovations that allow for the rapid automation of agriculture across different spaces, across dairy, across, uh, across fruit cultivation. The other thing you have to take into account in automation is that agricultural labor, farmers in India, are essentially, over the course of the next 10 to 20 years, and maybe fixing yield will change that, going to abandon agriculture. If you take any survey, any survey in any district in this country and ask farmers two questions. One, do they want their children to be in agriculture? Second, if you ask the children, do you want yeah. to be in agriculture? The answer you will get is 80 to 90% no. And I've actually asked the question, I asked the question in Guntur about a month ago. Um, it was a very interesting audience. It was a bunch of progressive farmers. And we actually asked the question of them in, in incredible amounts of detail, why don't you want your children to be in agriculture? And we got two big answers. We actually posed the question. We said, okay, maybe it's because you're poor and small, but let's say you had 50 hectares of land. Let's say you had 50 hectares of land, and it was throwing off 50 lakh a year in profit. You still don't want your kid to be in agriculture? And the answer was no. So why? Number one, I can't get him married. Okay? Dowry in Andhra Pradesh goes for a toss. One. And two, girls don't want to live in rural India. Vijayvada? Cool. Right? That's a big step up. That's okay. Hyderabad, ideal. But to stay in the same small town, unacceptable. Right? So getting the boys married. The second thing is the variability. So we asked 50 lakh a year, 50 hectares of land, 50 lakh a year, or a job at a bank making 20 lakh a year at SBI, let's say, as in a senior role. Every single one of them chose the bank. Every single one said, I would rather have my son working at a bank. Because that 50 lakh a year is 50 lakh a year average, and sometimes it's 10 lakh a year, and sometimes it's 90 lakh a year, and I don't need the stress, thank you very much. So we are going to face a massive abandonment of the agricultural sector in the next 10 or 20 years. Maybe yield will fix that, but the reality is automation is going to be required to keep this thing going. And the last two elements, and I will wrap this up, is processing and exports. This, you cannot imagine a world where we migrate 40% of the population from agriculture into something else and assume they're going to be working in auto factories or call centers. We're going to have to take them from agriculture into something semi-agricultural. It's going to have to be from agriculture to inputs. It's going to have to be from agriculture to agricultural machine companies. It's going to have to be from agriculture to 
food processing companies, the only way to create the jobs to migrate 40% of the country out of agriculture is going to be linked to agriculture. It's, it's illogical to imagine it would be any other way, right? And so it's gonna require building, putting food processing on the kind of war footing that IT was put on in the 1990s. If we can waste the kind of money we've wasted on SEZs over the course of the last decade, the, the debacle, if you will, and actually put it into building the requisite infrastructure, not for these mega food park nonsense, right, half the dominated schemes, right, but actually for proper lending support and infrastructure for food processing, we will give the Brazilians a run for their money. And the last aspect is exports, and this is, some, this is one of the most underreported stories in the agricultural economy, which is to say that we have gone 6x in exports over the course of the last decade. People don't realize this. We used to, it was a, it's a gross of about $40 billion. When we net out the edible oil and the pulses, right, it's about 28 to $30 billion. It used to be $5 billion a decade ago. This is the transformation. This is the new game. What is this made up of? It's seafood. It's farmed shrimp. It's guar gum. It's basmati rice going around the world. Right? We've become a net exporter of rice and wheat. Take that, LBJ. Okay? We, you know, and, and it's of course, you know, the, the pink revolution that's giving Modi conniption fits. Right? Three billion dollars a year of buffalo that is going out of this country, right? Mostly to the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And by the way, if we can get in a bilateral trade agreement with China, that will be ten billion dollars a year of buffalo going out of this country, and huge amounts of jobs and wealth for farmers. So this is the kind of framework that at Omnivore we look at. Again, get the yields up, automate it, because you're not going to have people in it the way you have. Migrate the people that are in it into jobs and food processing, and into the exports that will allow us to market to the entire world, and get over your China hangover, and start playing a Brazilian game. It's a lot more fun. Fantastic. So, thank you. Thank Ape. you is the mantra, right? So, Yape. Yape. Y-A-P-E. <laughs> so let's get to Ankur, maybe, and uh, Mayesh will come back to you. So let's look at education, come to skillings, then I can get Rangan in from an entrepreneur perspective, and then Vishnu can look at it from a social entrepreneur angle. So what are you seeing happening in education? What needs to happen? So uh, thanks a lot, Madan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to IntelliCap for, for hosting us. Uh, uh, I'd love to get a sense from the audience as to you know, how many people have actually worked or how many people work in, uh, in rural India, what's the sense of sort of people who are working with entrepreneurs or with uh, startups versus uh, uh, investors. So rural India, okay, good 60, 70%. How many entrepreneurs or people who are working with startups? Okay, excellent. So I'm sure people know a lot more than, uh, than we do, so forgive me for, <laughs> um, uh, for, share, for demonstrating my ignorance. But, uh, you know, I, I very much agree with uh, what Mark has, uh, has said, that uh, the engine for progress in the rural economy will be, uh, will be agriculture. Um, when we talk about education, education is obviously an investment that the families make, which is not immediately productive. Uh, yet, it is something that we believe is critical. Um, I'm sure all of you know uh, the Assar statistics, but if you'll permit me to just rehash them a little bit, uh, we can just explain sort of what is transpiring in some of the homes uh, in, uh, in rural India. Uh, so, 30% of children in rural India, as as per 2013 statistics, are now going to private schools. 26% um, of class three children, only 26% of class three children can do basic subtraction. That means 74% of class three children cannot do basic subtraction. 40% um, of class five children can read a standard two text. That means 60% cannot. Um, so we have, uh, by any standard, kind of a crisis of learning. 
which will telescope into productivity five, ten years down the road uh, as these children enter the labor force uh, and walk into the kind of enterprises that Mark is talking about, uh, let alone the existing labor force today and the level of skilling that is uh, present in the existing labor force. Coupled with a change in aspiration that Neelkant referred to, um, of course, I've talked about the shift of uh, children from public school to private school, which is a representation of this changing in aspiration. Um, it is being driven by an increase in telecoms infrastructure. So uh, I think Neil referred to 50% mobile penetration in rural. The stat I've heard uh, and validated by Aser is 70%, which is 70% of rural households have access to mobile phones, uh, which means a lot more information. Uh, and then the most interesting stat uh, that I felt was uh, relevant is that now 80% of rural households, while the proportion of access to televisions is unchanged, 80% of rural households have cable TV. Um, so aspirations are far outpacing our ability to deliver increase in learning. Um, and, uh, and this is a serious issue that we need to tackle. Uh, so uh, how does this kind of play out? Uh, this play out plays out in a couple of ways. One, uh, you know, people have invested in education over time in public schools, now in private schools, without much return. Um, and so, you, because learning levels are roughly the same, uh, although ASA reports increased learning levels in, uh, in private schools, the learning levels are still measured just by basic subtraction, addition, and ability to read text rather than higher order levels of learning. Uh, so I would argue that learning levels are, are universally poor uh, compared to where we need them to be. Uh, yet, as aspirations are outpacing our ability to deliver, people are really looking more and more for tangible return to their investment. Um, an example, well, let me come to that later. So one is a, a kind of a tangible return to investment. Uh, two is, uh, and we have a couple of portfolio companies that, uh, uh, that, that actually try to address this in partnership, of course, with NSDC. Uh, we have a company called LaborNet that trains informal sector workers, and Madan knows uh, LaborNet well, uh, in which training is actually performed on site. Uh, so you have a very direct relationship between training uh, an outcome of that training for both the employee as well as the employer. And most of these, in fact, all of them, as Neil mentioned, 90% of our labor force is informal. Uh, we believe it's actually 93%. Uh, most of these workers are uh, seasonal, uh, weekly, monthly, uh, or even seasonal. Uh, going back and then our ability to track them once they've gone back is very low. Uh, so tangibility of product is extremely important and is something that we find is very difficult to do in education. Uh, and, and this is an area of opportunity. So the, the first area of opportunity that I think over the long term uh, will be crucial is assessments. Uh, I think Pranav is sitting in the audience from, uh, from EI. Uh, and EI are working on a very interesting uh, assessment products that, uh, at least in urban India, are beginning to uh, deliver uh, learning outcome assessments across schools. And this is something that we need to bring to rural India. So what is it that will give parents the confidence that their children are learning in a job-relevant manner? So I think this is number one uh, a challenge, uh, number one opportunity. Um, the second is uh, actually translating parents, is is addressing parents' willingness to pay. So in another one of our companies called Hippocampus, which again, mother knows well, uh, we started out with uh, providing both preschool and secondary school education. Uh, preschool was full-time, secondary school was after school. And we found that parents were willing to pay up to 3,000 rupees for preschool education for the year. Uh, whereas they were only willing to pay about 1,100 rupees for secondary school for the year. Um, 
we haven't figured out why that was. Uh, the uh, at least the immediate implication for us was that we were not able to deliver the kind of quality of service at the secondary level uh, that we wanted. And so we've decided to focus on preschool education. I think Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo also reflected this uh, stat in poor economics in their chapter on education that parents are much more willing to invest in early childhood education than they are in later education. Perhaps has something to do with the labor market and maybe uh, my uh, co-panelists have better responses for that. Uh, but if we're able to translate parents' willingness to pay into, again, job-relevant skills that have clear outcomes, then we have a chance today of influencing what the labor market will look like 10 years out. Um, because we're talking about children who are about five years yeah. of age. Um, and then lastly is a question of what to do with uh, children who are starting to enter the labor force. So these are children who are anywhere between 12 to uh, 19 years who are either dropping out of school, going into diploma programs, coming out of diploma programs with relative lack of skill. Uh, and I think here's where we've sort of struggled the most uh, to uh, address the issue of aspiration, willingness to pay, and job relevance. Uh, so in, again, partnership with NSDC, we've uh, worked with and looked at several companies uh, that are providing formal training and job placement. Uh, and I think we've struggled. Uh, uh, I'm sure that Mahesh has uh, better insights into this than I do. Uh, but uh, with the help of NSDC's STAR scheme, I think we're beginning to convince candidates to come to training, uh, to at least get certified, because NSDC subsidizes this certification and takes away the challenge of the immediate uh, tangibility of outcome. And we have an opportunity to convert the STAR scheme into job placements that are meaningful, which Madan has already started talking about uh, head held high doing. Um, and whether we can do that at large scale is really an opportunity that as an industry, the education and skilling industry has uh, at least until August 15th before yeah. the STAR scheme runs out. Uh, and then using the, the larger numbers of certified uh, out of school or uh, uh, you know, entrance to the labor market uh, to really place into meaningful, sustainable jobs that translate into careers. Thanks. Great. No, very good analysis of the entire schooling system that kind of leads to the question that that's, that's going around in your talk, Ankur, skills and where, do, where does the labor market, how do skills get developed that it get integrated with markets? So, Mahesh? Uh, Mahesh, I represent National Skill Development Corporation. Just to give a basic understanding of what this is, uh, in 2008, we celebrated 60 years of India, and there was a team that sat together which said, let's celebrate India at 60, but let's look at what we will be at 75. And it was called India at 75. And they sat together, Professor Prahlad and a whole bunch of them, they said, what are the things that we need to look at? And one of the things that came out very evidently is, of course, the population is going up, but we're also going to have a whole bunch of people coming into the workforce. Now, you will have to engage them, which means you will need to impart something, formal education, skills, whatever it is, you need to engage them into the uh, productive workforce. So with that idea, and then they went back to the drawing table and said, who is doing all this skilling today in, the, in, in India? If it's education, you've got private sector coming in, but if you look at skilling, it's ITIs, polytechniques, and um, so on and so forth. But is the industry happy with the output? that's coming out of these institutions. If you complete a two-year program in an ITI in welding and fitting, are you a good welder or fitter who can go and work in the shop floor? Maybe not, maybe yes, in most cases not. So let's try to bridge this. So let's not look at an input-driven model, let's look at best practices around the world, let's look at the German VET, Swiss VET model, the Australian, the New Zealand plumbing model, went around, scoped around the world and came out and said, let's look at an outcome-based model. Now, if I am a welder, it doesn't matter if I'm in a class for two years with this much of workshop experience, maybe the infrastructure is bad, there is no machinery which talks about uh, welding in that particular scenario, uh, in, it's not relevant to industry, the people who are coming and training are not uh, certified or capable to train or not keeping abreast with what's going on. So let's say 
we flip that and we make it outcome-based, and let's take a welder, let him go through a 45-day program, let's keep it flexible, a three-month program, a six-month program, based on what his starting point is. Let's measure the guy at the end of it. And let's say, is he able to do six tasks? Is he able to hold a soldering machine? Is he able to do a job on the, uh, on the go? And how much time is he doing it? How stable is our hands? And how he's going about the whole task? Now then they, we went back to the industry and said, OK, if this is what you want to solve, can you help us solve it? And the industry came back and said, of course, this is what we do in our internal capacity building, because we get all these guys who are not really employable. And we do our internal training. LNT does for construction. Mahindra does it for this thing. Tata's do it for the shop floor. So do retail, Future Sharp, and so on, and Future Group, and so on and so forth. Then we went back. I think I really <laughs> like what Neil Khan said about the data. Uh, there's two kinds of data which come out uh, from rural. One is distress data, X number of farmers died in Y location. Or it is good growth data. Mobile phones have gone up, and so on and so forth. Fantastic. Now what do we do about it? Mm. Let's put the data back on the table. Let's do a deep dive. And what we did is we started with a skill gap analysis. How many w people are in the workforce today, be it informal, formal manufacturing, agriculture, say 400 odd million population, which is productive. Let's see what this population is going to be in terms of incremental people who are going to come into the workforce across multiple sectors. Let's take the Planning Commission report and see what are the high growth sectors that they've identified. We said it's going to be another 347 million people coming into the workforce incrementally between now and 2022. Out of that, 247 is going to come from multiple sectors, and 100 million is going to come from building construction infrastructure, and you're going to have uh, 5 million from IT, uh, some, another this thing from processing, so on and so forth. Now what do we do? Do we have adequate capacity? Today there are 100 guys coming out of village, there is 15 seats. I, I think it's slightly better than uh, preschool admission, I guess, but it's still very low capacity. So let's say we need to ramp up capacity. So how do we ramp up the capacity? So we took this data, went to corporates and said, would you invest in businesses? Now, then we built in a mechanism which would incentivize for them to come into the sector. So over the last five years, we've committed over 2,500 crores in capital to 129 skill ventures. So our portfolio is very uh, big. And they hope they have uh, 2,500 centers running, or over 2,500 centers running between these 129 partners across every district. Uh, I think 27 states and union territories last that we know of data from March. And I think, what is it? OK, now we've got capacity. What needs to change inside that premise, inside that center? It shouldn't be an input-driven model. It's got to be an outcome-based model. But who is going to set the standards? Who is going to assess? Who is going to certify? So then we went to the industry and said, here is a grant for you. Would 10 of you guys who are owners of hospitals, Max, Fortis, Ames, whatever you are, and you can you come and sit in the governing council and say, what kind of jobs are you going to create? I know you have deficit of doctors, nurses, rural, urban, all that. But can you tell us how many x-ray technicians, lab technicians, and all the other people? So if you go into a hospital and you think that you don't get the best care, even, if, even though the doctor is from Harvard or Ames, that's because 80% or 89% of 90% of the people who are supporting him don't have the skills to actually make him efficient or the process efficient. So whatever care you're going to ask for, you're never going to get it. You go, to a, uh, uh, you go to a fancy restaurant, you pay a lot of money, you still don't get the service. There is fun something fundamentally wrong. So we went back to the industry and said, let's form sector skill councils. These sector skill councils are going to do two things, three things. One, first identify the labor market supply and demand, labor market information system. Tell me how many jobs is your sector going to create based on the investments that are going into the sector. Give me proportionately what's the number of jobs that you're getting in that. In the jobs, define the jobs that you're going to bring into the sector. Is it going to be a coffee plantation worker, tea plantation worker, a dairy farmer? Is it, are you going to be a micro-irrigation technician? Are you going to be a greenhouse technician? What is the kind of jobs that you're looking at which will enhance your productivity and keep your funnel going? Or in the last two years, since we, uh, the sector skill councils have actually uh, matured, we have created 600 unique job roles. Now, what do these job roles have? The job roles have what we call occupation standards. If I'm a welder, I have to do six tasks. Now, these are the six tasks. As the industry generally has sat together around a table, the HR learning development training teams have come together and said, these are the six tasks you need to know. Now, I've got the six tasks. I've got a qualification pack, which refers to a job role of a welder. And I've got training capacity on one end. What are the two missing pieces in it? Assessment and certification. If I'm a young guy, 
who is going in for a, wants a computer or a BPO job, if I'm in Nashik, I go to the main bus stand and I see this well, three-story building and I see how many of you offer a retail job training or whatever. There's 30 of them from 3,000 rupees to 30,000 rupees. What happens there? I provide the training, I provide the assessment, and I provide the certification with my logo on it. Now, who validates this whole thing and how, what's, how do you measure the quality on this one? So we said, let's create assessment companies because we do not have the concept of a third-party assessment because our assessment is essentially going out to an infrastructure and saying, hey, there's four walls to it and there are four teachers, nothing beyond it. So we flipped that model and said that now we have around 20 odd assessment companies which have been created. Now what I really want to rec want the, here to put forth is in every step of the way in the ecosystem we are creating a market. You have 120 skill ventures and a huge pipeline of companies which want to come in. There are 20 assessment agencies involving all kinds of assessments. Guys who have done IT assessment for Wipro are doing tea plantation and banana plantation, this thing on a tablet and somewhere they're doing a mobile based assessment, they're doing an online assessment through using MOOCs and so on and so forth. Now we come to the certification part. Once the assessor goes to a learner in a center which is affiliated with NSDC, say for example, the autom and that is a job role of an automotive repair technician, the certification agency goes in, uh, the assessment agency gives a report saying, this guy is good, and this is where you can position him. Now, do you give him a general certificate? Well, going to that second question, how can we integrate careers and market opportunity rather than just training? And the other one, how do you construct careers? Now, why, uh, why do I have a career? Why does anybody here have a career? Because you continue to learn. So let's bring in upward mobility. Let's bring in continuous learning. So we created something called the National Skills Qualification from Framework, NSQF, which has 10 levels to it. If you are a plumber, you're not just a plumber. In India, you build a Kutub Minar with a bamboo with uh, wood, or you do something in the house, which is a carpentry job, or you do something else, you're a carpenter. In any other system, it's you're a craftsman, you're a master craftsman, you're a cabinet maker. Let's bring all those things into the fray. And we said, okay, now we need levels. Now, if you got in and at a certain level, you're issued a certificate which says you are qualified at this level in the national standards. And the industry accepts you as a welder who is qualified at this level. In the process, what you've done is you've given that person an opportunity to learn and upskill themselves or have an opportunity to have continuous learning. I think in NCR region, at least I can speak, 80% of the plumbers come from three blocks in Orissa. Now, if you look at the plumber's life cycle, uh, in terms of you do a life cycle analysis of the career of a plumber, it's a plumber. There is no life cycle analysis, it's a single dot, it's a plumber. So let's see, what could this guy do? This guy can be a plumber in a household, he could be in a construction D, he can be in oil and gas, he could be in chemicals, he could be in avionics, uh, aviation, he could be in undersea uh, oil drilling, this thing. Here is your opportunity to take that guy from what he came as from a village in Orissa with his uncle 15 years ago and has the skills to take him upward. That is how you take him upward. And every step of the way he gets paid more, there is more dignity. Then he has the same choices as you and I have to pick a private school or a public school, access the healthcare that you have or I have, and he's empowered. We don't need to handhold him. And I think that's something very, uh, Thing and now entrepreneurial spirit. 11,000 employers, over 11,000 employers, d take people from NSDC. If you look at 2009 and 10, we trained 20,000 people through our network. Closing last year, we trained over a million people. Our target this year is 3.3 million, and we're going to double up every six months in terms of for us to reach a 150 million target. So the pace at which we are working, the management systems that are going in, the processes that are going in, we are only 35 people just to let you know. And so. We're doing every activity of ours by catalyzing the private uh, sector. We are just giving a loan of 6% and saying, you come in, you play in this, you be an entrepreneur, you be an education company, you be an uh, agriculture company, you be whatever, but your target is to create jobs. Now, this setting the standards, and now we're going into entrepreneurship and saying, what kind of jobs do you have? I mean, of 11,000 plus employers, 85% of people take less than five people from our institutions, which, signify, which says really, as much as a sector uh, at the MSME cottage and uh, this thing, you see that there is a huge uptake of skill manpower that's happening. And that is a welcome trend and we definitely want to grow on it. And now if you go back to the mobile repair technicians and uh, all the things, it's the service 
required at the rural level, rural services, rural to rural, and you need capabilities. Now, what is the problem there that we face? Every entrepreneur that we, who, most of the entrepreneurs who come into us brings in technology. There is no content underlying that technology. How would you train? Great, you've got a technology, e-learning, e-health, whatever you want to call it, but what is underneath it? Do you have a content piece to, uh, with an adaptive learning system with, uh, which says that I'm going to train a guy an X-ray technician? Then you have actually provided the guy a skill which will lead to a job. Now, so there is, that, that is an issue that we face from an entrepreneurship perspective, uh, be it even farming in terms of productivity, uh, be it uh, dairy in terms of uh, cattle rearing and what kind of inputs go in, how do you take care of the cattle and so on and so forth. Now, coming back to, asp coming to aspirations, a um, lot of them want to definitely go into IT banking. Now, it is easy to brush off and say that, yes, this is it. But what is the proposition that they have? What is the information that they have to make the choices that they make? That is a very key imperative. If I know that Wipro is going to pay 200 rupees for you to work an extra day in Bangalore uh, in their office on a Saturday, and a plumber in uh, NCR gets 400 rupees to do a one-hour job, is that a proposition that you take forward to him? No, you don't. What you take forward to him is some, com something completely different. So what we are saying is, you need counseling. We have employment exchanges. Let's convert them into career centers or counseling centers. Let's provide adequate counseling and put, disrupt the information asymmetry and provide them as much information as you and I have to make choices on their lives. Let them make the choices that they want to make about their lives with all the information that they have in the languages, in the nature that they want it. You disseminate it through a fixed center, a mobile phone, a tower, what, whatever, an IVR, miscall technology, whatever it is. Just to give an example of what the STAR scheme is, it's basically saying, here are guys, I have five options in front of me. I've got to go or take a retail job. Somebody offers me 5,000 rupees for this thing. Somebody's offering me a free program. Somebody's offering me a 10,000 thing uh, program. I'll give you a certificate. I'll give you a job. What do I pick? The guy, they're going to go for the lowest common denominator. And usually, the lowest con common denominator is going to lack in quality, which means you're going to be shortchanged in the process. So the STAR scheme, which was launched in August, is a 1,000 crore scheme which was targeted at 10 lakh people where you have the choice for you to pick the course in the center that you want to do. Now, we wanted to activate the campaign, so we set up a missed call center. Until then, in our call centers, until we launched a television commercial on all channels, which is an 11-week spot, what we saw was 450 people were calling us and giving us missed calls. That Sunday, 45,000 people called us. Before Thursday, we had a 1.7 lakh call backlog. So the scale of what we are talking about is tremendous. Now, you've set the aspirations, you've asked them to call, now you have to meet those aspirations. Do we have the capacity? Do we have the standards? Do we have the jobs to do it? I think that's another important aspect of it. Uh, Maesh, uh, sorry to, I, I think the topic is, I, skills itself has a challenge of saying that, hey, we could actually fill the whole thing. So if I might interrupt you there. Sure and actually just pull in Rangan and uh, Vishnu and bring it back to sure. a couple of things you're talking about in terms of skills development as well as the ecosystem that you're building in and the trust towards moving in just from job seekers to job creator mentality and catering to aspirations. In the q and I'll come back to that. We will have about 10 minutes for that. We will, so the organizers just told me that we are running, we have our deadline looming large. So if I can just pull that conversation to Rangan and Vishnu and Rangan from an entrepreneurial spirit and that ability to access finance, what is that very key component of, of building the, th that part of the economy itself? What are you seeing on the ground? And we will link it back to both Agri as well as what we're seeing on the skills development side. Sure. Uh, starting with uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, let me start with the example. A few days back, I was in Devgarh district in Jharkhand. Uh, I had been there about nine months back. So we had done, uh, selected some entrepreneurs for them to provide micro credit. And here I go, after uh, eight months, <clears throat> the road has been laid. This is a 30 kilometers from Devgarh. Devgarh is a small district. 30 kilometers, road has been laid. When I went first, this village has had about uh, uh, 60 to 70 households, max. Uh, nothing much happening there. People have been par partially as coolie workers outside and uh, uh, doing some agriculture whenever they could. Now I see three shops, two run by young kids, young in the sense about 
20 years, 22, 23 years old. One running a mobile repair shop, one running a tire uh, vulcanizing shop, the other was a Kirana shop. Just three shops in here. The beauty is no electricity in this village, but poles were there, eight poles, I guess, which has been done by various ministers. I was surprised. I went to this uh, first vulcanizing guy. Hey, why did you start? Why didn't you go about in Devgarh and start the same business? He said, it takes time. I want to be at home. That's the word he used. And I get, I earn about now 400 rupees per day, 4 to 450. Mm. Next, I went to this mobile uh, uh, repairing shop. Amazing. Small shop. Uh, no electricity, keep in mind. I was surprised to see one. Then I saw a wire going up, a small solar panel, which is okay. Uh, main thing in a so mobile repairing, we need uh, soldering. Awesome innovation. A small gas, there are that cylinder kind of a gas with that. He comes in, has a, a rough uh, steel and lead and all that stuff. That's the spirit. He says, I now make about 300 rupees per day. So the point that I'm making is, Spirit is there, they want to create a business as long as the opportunity comes. And this opportunity, as somebody was mentioning, the roads come, yeah. there is an enterprise created. I asked them, how do they charge the mobile? I mean, uh, uh, the, the people out here, I mean, uh, Beauty was just about two kilometers from that village, another village has electricity. People walk two kilometers every day to charge their mobile. mobile. I mean, amazing. Okay, the point is, there is a spirit, there are people want to tra get and be in the rural economy. Now coming to the, the next level of uh, financial intervention, what is the aspiration? Now coming close to Bombay, here in the Hanu, uh, tribal village, Varli painting groups, what, what they are looking for, which we are working with them for the last one and a half years, is a model which can, what we have talked about, higher productivity or higher gains out of whatever today they do. We are working with them on running, go trying in a more professional way, which can give them higher income. That's a prime goal and a higher scale. What, what requires for us to create, create higher productivity? One is the knowledge. Clearly, most of the people have basic knowledge, but not to run a professional corporate kind of organization. They certainly have the knowledge how to run a, a goat, I mean, how to take care of goats, how to account and how to innovate. Okay, we provide professional uh, advice, getting uh, people from Bombay Veterinary College and giving them a lot of inputs on raw material procurement marketing, which is all being done in variety of different things. But the most important thing that I found was on the funding pattern, financing pattern. Here, the, the aspiration there is somebody to share profit or loss. So what it meant for us was to innovate on not a plain vanilla debt product out here, but a micro equity. I mean, if I look at it, that's where I like this rural urban connect. I mean, if I start something in urban, I am a say tech start startup. The first thing I look at or whatever people here are looking at is equity. But the same kind of a product, the same scenario, these are startups. These people have been doing go tree, uh, dairy and all that stuff in a very small scale. Now they want to scale it up. They are looking at a yeah. equity kind of a comp component. So how do you give equity at a micro level? I mean, here when I say micro level, a 5 lakh, a 3 lakh kind of a thing. And I mean, people do say, hey, at a such small ticket, one can it be done? Yes, it can be done. A technology, that, that's where the structuring, the technology innovation. So the point is the aspiration for them is to, yes, run the business in such a way and also be able to access the kind of products, financial. especially in the financial thing. And this is not just a single example that I'm talking about. No, we haven't tried too many things about seven such enterprises. We call it as a micro venture, but that is the need of the hour in, uh, in I think I know there's Akshay Kalpa out here who is, so they are also trying similar kind of models out there. So that's some of the experience that I wanted to share. Thanks, uh, Rangan. So Vishnu? Yeah. Uh, you know, from, from an Ashoka perspective, uh, we work with a lot of social entrepreneurs and every, every month we kind of hear about new ways of uh, doing business or improving access in the rural areas and in the urban areas. So I just want to kind of 
set one theme which we have been observing a lot in the last maybe couple of years is what I personally call it as tearing down the walls, right? Meaning you see that a lot of differences between X and Y, I'm just using X and Y generically, but I'll just get to it in a minute, is all breaking down. Meaning you don't see, uh, you know, uh, companies versus social consciousness as two different things what it used to be a few years ago. You know, you don't see uh, equity as pure equity and no longer as a grant driven model. People are able to accept both. So what I'm saying is extremities are thinning down. We are seeing a lot of extremes coming together as one solution. And the same would apply to, uh, you know, urban, rural as well. And it all boils down to, I think, what Rangan started with about saying improving access to something, improving access to infrastructure or improving access to information. Now, obviously, like what Rangan pointed out, it automatically brings out people to do something. You know, I always say that even as urban Indians, we all live in the urban areas, we still have lack of access to something. You know, we don't probably start, we can't start a Kickstarter campaign sitting in, in India, we still can't. But we'll figure out ways to solve it. As long as we had the access to that infrastructure, we would find a solution. But what is interesting is that we are seeing a lot of social organizations coming up by combining access to infrastructure or information or markets combining with empowerment. You know, I think that's what we see as a huge trend, which really changes a lot of things. The minute you are able to empower somebody to do something, then you are changing the equation there. Traditional businesses always looked at intellectual property, right? Meaning, in a social equation, intellectual property takes a completely different sense. It's, it's, I don't think any of our Ashoka fellows are sitting there and saying, or any social entrepreneur sitting there and saying, I want to protect my intellectual property with a patent or something. But it's all about empowering somebody else to do you what you're doing. 90% of Ashoka Fellows work has been replicated on a national level wherever they are working. So it's about letting go, right? Meaning it's about letting go of your model in a way that you empower somebody. Now that is the key thing which we are observing as the first trend. That it's about a new way of doing business. It's about a new way of doing things where you're really letting go. The second one which you're really observing is not to look at it from an urban rural dimension at all anymore, it's also about intra-rural, uh, right? Meaning, we probably know what's happening in Hyderabad sitting here or what's happening in Cairo even in the next minute, but if you take a villager, what's happening in the next village takes a long time for him to know because simply the infrastructure does not exist to connect those hubs, meaning what's happening between villages, they simply don't have an idea. So we are seeing a lot more innovation, lot more ideas coming up about connecting between rural areas, improving access to information between them. Now again, the minute you connect, innovation happens there automatically, right? Like how do you grow mangoes in an off season? A villager knows, but the neighboring village does not know about it. So how do you improve access to that information? Digital green is a classic example of how that happens using videos or you know, how do you access news in the local areas in the villages? Maybe video volunteers helps in some way. So I think that is what is happening as a second trend. Now the third thing, and I really want to probably stop here because I know we are running out of time, is never see it saying that rural is something lower or something. You know, we have equally our, our amount of problems. Yesterday I just read that Abbott Nutrition did a survey and said that seven out of ten kids in the metro cities of India are malnourished. Now, 70% of urban kids are getting malnourished is really a significant problem. You know, the rural areas, we had a survey in Gadag yeah. where we only touched 45, right? Meaning, so we are saying that the problems we have are much more deeper than even what they have. Because we coupled with a little bit of arrogance and knowing how to solve it, we are not even open to listening, right? So, for example, how do you know that our problems cannot be solved by a villager. Absolutely. Maybe they will, can solve our problems as well. Right. It is not about doing just these things, but also trying to get back some of these things. You know, I'll just end with this thing that Ashoka believes that one of the basic qualities of even wanting to become a social change maker is empathy, right? You know, you have to be empathetic to understand the problems. That's why all of us are here talking about some of these problems. But my argument is that 
the urban areas, we are becoming lesser and lesser empathetic than the rural areas, right? So we have a lot to learn from there. You know, the problem is between here and the US, the American ecosystem or the European uh, societies, empathy is a huge problem. Meaning people don't know what empathy is all about because it's all about individual, it's all about this, but that hope is still prevalent a lot more in the uh, rural areas than even in the urban areas. So we have a lot to learn from each other. So it's not just about influencing our thinking to somebody else, but also trying to bring back some of that. So I think the ecosystems, what we need to build is about cross-learning ecosystems, and that's what we are seeing as a trend, and that's what really is very powerful now. And I'm really thankful that none of the panelists here, I think, have been negative. You know, it's problems prevail, but I think end of the day, we all are really, really hopeful. Absolutely. That is really what is um, encouraging, and I think we'll see a lot more success in the years to go. Thanks a lot, Vishnu. And I think uh, on that note, let me open it up to three questions from the audience. We really had budgeted half an hour. We were on track, but we need to crunch because we started late. So can I have three questions? We'll take all the questions together, then I'll have the panel respond. And from each one of you, if there are three words that you can think of that you want to leave as parting thoughts to the audience, you know, just three words about what do you think about the future of rural, right? Maybe those are the, those are the words that we can kind of soak in and, and think about it. So can I have the mic around uh, for three questions? I'll take it, one from the lady, one from this gentleman, and we'll leave the last one. Okay, so the other two questions, I'll make sure that you're able to get to these guys at lunch hour. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, so M Mark spoke about the, uh, um, the, the agriculture sector. So I just wanted to, my own last uh, one year of immersion in actually working with heading a farmer producer company is that a, a serious problem of a risk and a value imbalance in the sense that the farmer and, and, the, and it's important to segment the farmers to understand who our farmers are and what categories they occupy. And I'm talking about a small and marginal farmer who is around 80% of a farmer's size. Right? He, uh, we did a sort of a risk analysis and, and found that there are 343 parameters that contribute to about 80% of the risk in the agri-value chain being concentrated on the farmer and only around 20% of the value, right, of the end value being at the, at the control at the farmer's level. And the remaining 80% of the value are, uh, are sort of handled by, by a complex network of traders, money lenders, exporters, and processors. And, and this, we feel, is, is, is one of the uh, a huge roadblock to actually uh, allowing not just access, but control of infrastructure and, 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 and restore it. And, and we sort of trying to find out how the, the new format of companies called for producer companies, which are actually for-profit institutions, but owned completely by producers, can restore this balance. But unless, like, like uh, 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 Neil Kansar pointed out, that the, the roads, okay, as, as, as a physical infrastructure being, being in control and accessible to the farmer, the same way unless warehouses, processors, Cold storage are also not restored and controlled by, the, by this, this category of farmers, the sector will not sort of sure. open up. Sure. Yeah. So the question we'll come back to is, how do you balance the risk versus value and what, what needs to be done? So we'll take the second one and we'll kind of pull in the questions. Yeah, um, you started with Gadag, uh, in between urban and rural. Uh, I'm working uh, in an area called Raigad, mm -hmm. which is just 40 minutes from, from Bombay. Bombay. Yeah. And believe me, I'm working with some self-help group ladies, uh, and I'm finding so difficult that the transport is first big challenge, mm. and the second one is communication. They do not know that if I'm making X product, I can sell it to the Somebody next lady else. sitting with me. And I think these challenges are basic, and unless we solve this or we have some kind of ways to correct this, it's difficult. So what you're saying is there's a basic mindset issue that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. About. Uh, one thing which I would like to uh, I, I didn't get his name, NSDC. Mahesh. Mahesh. I feel that we are going to make some more mistakes in the entire ex uh, experiment that we are doing. The entire NSDC, and I may be wrong, and I'll be happy if I'm wrong, they are again we are going through a dry run of giving them a technical training without bringing the human quotient as a person. We are not giving them the basic HR, so-called HR trainings, which people at a little bit at a corporate level get. Decision making, 
seeing dreams, conflict management, empathy, interpersonal relations, and most importantly, marketing if they are going to be entrepreneurs. So it's not about just technical skills, but how do you bring the social... I, I have been breaking on. my head with NSDC for right. so long. Sure. So we, and there is no we, response. <laughs> okay. So we have one last question there for the, for the chap standing right at the back. The mic is on. Uh, Sorry. Okay, uh, we'll take one more. I, I just put... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you with this rural perspective in my experience with traveling to rural areas and also associating with people from there. You know, earlier there was social and enterprise separate and we then put together them and said social enterprise. We had rural and urban separate and today we are putting them together and trying. You know, is it actually we are trying to separate this, you know, in purpose and then again trying to put them together just as and when it is convenient for us and, you know, again separate them as, as and when the market says, you know, you should look at it at two different sectors. Because most of the urban areas are built out of rural areas, you know, and most of the rural areas today get us up, you know, are existing because of the urban areas. So, I think there's no, actually, there's no rural and urban really. This is only about, like, you know, what is more populated and what is, what is the requirements. So, do you actually see this purposeful play in, in, in minds of financiers or even the market players to actually kind of separate them and make them look different and then again put them together and say they are the same? you know sure. so it's like sure sure so with that and sorry about that i just saw a gun being waved at me by the organizers so let me take those three questions put it back uh, you know and and maybe mark and mahesh and the last one is really about how do you look at it as a continuum rather than than the piecemeal side so if you can address that and then you know do those three words we'll end with that sure is this this is working uh, to answer your question on, on farmer producer companies, um, I, I'm, I'm actually quite excited about the potential of farmer producer companies, so I just want to say that uh, up front. Um, I think we have to benchmark a uh, percentage of value capture that our farmers get as a total, uh, you know, at, at versus retail price against sort of the global norm rather than assuming that just because they have all the risks on their head that the global norm is that they would capture the entire retail price. That doesn't exist anywhere, right? Uh, but admittedly, because of some of the very, very strong intermediaries that exist in India, many of which are essentially legislatively mandated, the value capture here is lower than elsewhere. And I think the, the farmer producer company um, is, is a good approach to try to reverse that by getting the marketing function, by getting the distribution function, ideally eventually the processing function integrated with, with groups of farmers. I would probably add two other things. One is there's a lot of legacy product farming in India. There are a lot of really low profitability products that people continue to make season after season after season after season. Sometimes there are reasons like water stress, sometimes there are the abiotic stress that those products can handle like ruggy, right? You have a bad rainfall, you can still grow ruggy. Um, sometimes it's just that this is what we've always done, right? Throughout South India yeah. there is a continual cultivation of rice, and there will be for time immemorial because that's the way it is. Um, so one of the things with farmer producer companies is that I, I hope to see them transforming groups of farmers away from traditional crops towards higher yielding, ideally fruit and vegetable cultivation in places where, where the potential value capture, especially if you go downstream, is higher. The last and final point is that sometimes the system of risk is put on the heads of farmers because when you put it on the organized sector, it's actually even worse. When a farmer defaults on a loan, he defaults on a loan. Hmm. When a corporate defaults on a loan, it it's is a not. I mean, so it's, it's an interesting scenario. You see this in poultry farming quite a bit, where um, the ability of the informal sector to absorb the volatility in, the, in, in pricing and the fact that you have severe periods of, of, of kind of negative returns is actually higher than the ability of the formal sector which has to show steady profits and yeah. steady returns and otherwise banks freak out and all of these things. I agree that it winds up getting dumped on people who don't have the capacity to hold the risk. But legally it gets dealt with informally, whereas when, it, when, you, have a play, when you have an integrator that is trying to take that risk and goes through the same things, they wind up being permanently bankrupt. It's, it's, just, it's the way law functions in a formal way versus an informal right. way. It's not an ideal situation, but it is oftentimes the situation. Sure. It's a very interesting point that you're saying. It's, it, yeah. So, Mahesh, if you can address the soft skills side of things, yeah. and how do you bring that uh, human element? Quickly? Just to, one of the things our previous chairman was said was we had 60 years of unlearning. 
before we start the learning because we started <laughs> on bad fundamentals. But that said, uh, what we are talking about is particularly work-ready programs and work-ready skills. Now, if I, I will go back to the demand side and say, today, future group, say, Coffee, Coffee Day or uh, Tata Chroma or uh, SR Mobile Store, they're all hiring today. What kind of people do they want to be working with them, which is where the jobs are? Now, what we are saying is we actually look at how we have designed the qualification pack. It is untrue to say that it doesn't have those elements that you're talking about. It talks about knowledge about the organization. It talks about uh, health and safety standards. It's about technical skills is one of them. There are five or six parameters for each task. These five or six parameters are mapped, which is called occupational mapping. And I think what one of the things I just want to put forth is also in India, in terms of trainers, in terms of facilitators, in terms of counselors, in terms of coaches, and so on and so forth, we don't have formalized certifications which actually make a person trainer. Because you train in BPO doesn't mean you can train in retail, doesn't mean you can train somebody else in anything else, although all of them are client serving. Now, I think this. This is another challenge that we face because what we have, if a guy stays in, is in college, says, I want to be a teacher, all you have is a beard. Beyond that, you have nothing. Yeah. Now, from a beard, you're supposed to be a counselor. You're supposed to be a skill trainer in 25 sectors. And you're supposed to also provide life skills, soft skills, and all of that. And the aspirational level to be a trainer or a teacher is the yeah, lowest. Low. Yeah. Because all of them who don't get somewhere else do end up there. And this has, to, again, an area that we are working. We are actually working with the Australian VET system to pick up how they look at the pedagogy curriculum in terms of how they go about looking at a trainer, trainer certification, not just a master trainer. I, I, I think that is one thing. In terms of hitting a head against NSDC, I, I <laughs> change my car, we can exchange cards and I can see what I can do and where it is. We can probably starts, catch so. him at lunch and... and Last uh, response by Neelkant before we go on. Yeah, so on the rural urban continuum, and I've been itching to talk about that because, you know, uh, rural and urban, um, the definition in India is very different from that you find anywhere else, right? There is a, uh, because uh, in, in India we are largely, I mean, we grew out of villages, uh, the policy making needed to be defined separately, right? You know, that, that the needs for rural areas are very different from the needs for urban areas. Now, we are headed towards a continuum because if you just look at the uh, definition of urban as a population density measure, mm. then India is 70% urban, mm. right? India is far more urban than say Brazil or even a China. Uh, it is because we say that at most 25% of working males need to be in agriculture. Right. It is because of that definition that we are 31% urban, right? So, uh, you're absolutely right that if you have a village with 80% uh, pakka houses, 100% pakka houses, with 100% electrification, 70-80% of the households have a cell phone, uh, every house has a two-wheeler, uh, two uh, you know, there are air conditioners, I, mean, I would prefer to live there than in my house in Bombay. Now, uh, so, so the, and, and similarly, I mean, some of the challenges that you see in the shanty towns in the big cities are remarkably similar to the problems that you see yeah in ill-developed villages. So, so I, I fully agree, and I think the, uh, the thinking is also evolving. Uh, unfortunately, the classification of habitations as census towns and statutory towns is something which is not happening as fast as it should. But I think the realization is creeping in that the aspirations, and this is where, you know, politics and democracy is a wonderful thing. It works very slowly, as Atalji used to say that, you know, in Hindi, Jantantra ki chakki dhimi pisti hai, but mahin pisti hai. So, uh, so it, it moves slowly, but it corrects the problems. So it is because the politicians see these are the aspirations of the people, that I think policy will also change. Fantastic. So, shall we have those three words, Vishnu, maybe we can start with you. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, the solutions are with collaboration and co-creation. Okay. Yeah. So, collaboration, co-creation. I guess opportunity and learn from what they are doing and then work together. Opportunity, learn from what you're doing, move together, great. So I would say uh, transformation in a rural urban continuum. Okay. Fix agriculture first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say one. skills, skills and skills. Okay. Outcomes, not inputs. Wonderful. I think those are very key messages that our panel is living, uh, leaving behind for us. Terrific. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to have rushed the session. 
I know I didn't want to kind of stand between you, lunch, and the next session. Uh, panelists are available. Happy to take on any more questions subsequently. Thank you for being a wonderful audience and look forward to more meaningful conversations uh, on this. Thank you. <laughs>